So welcome to tonight's event, which is the first part of a uh, three-part series on the NEC, con NEC contracts. Tonight's speaker is William Brown, who is a qualified civil engineer, solicitor, and adjudicator at Fort Phil and Brown. William is a director at Fort Phil and Brown, who are a specialist legal firm with expertise in construction law, contract training, and dispute resolution. I'm now going to hand you over to William, and he will tell us a little bit more about the NEC. Thank you very much, William. Thank you very much, Philip. So just in terms of a bit of housekeeping, folks, first of all, can everybody hear and see me okay? If you just want to say yes in the chat, that would yes. be lovely. Yes. Perfect. Grand job. The last piece of housekeeping then, now that you can all hear and see me, um, in terms of the delivery this evening, I like these things to be as two-way as possible. So if there are any questions um, on the tip of your tongue, don't feel the need to wait until the end. Either turn on the microphone and shout it out as we go along. Again, that's totally fine. Or put it into the chat box. You'll maybe see me looking up every now and again. That's just me looking at the chat box to make sure that any questions are being answered. So mindful of that, um, first of all, thanks to Philip and Engineers Ireland for having me. We did this event about two years ago, just whenever, you know, doing training on Zoom became a thing in COVID-19. And thanks again for having me back. So you'll get a copy of these slides if you don't already have them. I'm not going to get into any more detail on the sales pitch. You've got the slides, but if you've got any questions um, that you need to um, send to myself, there's my email address and I will get back to you. So in terms of what we're covering here this evening, so as Philip says, this is the first of a three-part series. So we're very much using this evening to build the groundworks for what we're going to build upon in the subsequent weeks. So to do that, we need to have a good understanding of what the NEC is all about. You know, why does this contract, you know, attract the headlines? Why does it do things slightly differently than other traditional forms of contract like the JCT? Or for those of you that have worked in Ireland in the past, the likes of the public works contract why is the NEC different to those and that's what we're going to cover first of all and that's what I call the NEC philosophy the next thing that we're going to do is look at the structure of the ECC contract so in terms of acronyms I'll try to introduce any acronyms as we go along the ECC is the engineering and construction contract that's the main contract that you use in the NEC suite it's the contract between the client organization and the main contractor, that is the ECC. So if you see me referring to that term, that's what I'm talking about. In terms of the structure, we're going to look at the different documents that make up that particular contract. Again, you can take it off the shelf, but what parts of it need to be filled in and what parts of it need to be drafted bespoke. So that's what we're going to be looking at in terms of structure. We're also going to be looking at a couple of particular things to this form of contract. Um, and what I mean by that is the ability to choose a main option, mean option A, B, C, etc. Whenever you hear someone talking about an NEC, you'll probably hear them talking about an NEC option C, for example. And that's what we mean. Um, we're going to look at what exactly that main option selection does in terms of the pricing mechanism, who takes the risk of the prices. Um, and in terms of a couple of other points as well, the likes of the cash flow for the contractor and how it affects that. Then we're going to get on and we're going to look at two of the things that make the NEC very different. These are two project management tools, the first of which is the early warning mechanism, does what it says on the tin. It's a project management tool that you can use to flag up issues at an early point. And um, question for the audience, why would you want to early warn something? Why as a client would you want to know about a problem early, as early as possible? What do you think? What's the utility in that? To avoid it, Brian, absolutely, if you can, or if you can't avoid it, at least to try to mitigate it, to shrink the problem. And that is the exact purpose of the early warning mechanism. And um, so that both parties can flag the problem so that they can bash their heads together in a collaborative way to try to resolve it. If that problem solving ultimately results in an instruction to change the scope, for those of you that have used the NEC3 before, that's what the works information is. It's now called the scope under NEC4. Um, so if you instruct a change to that document, it will be a compensation event, but the theory is it will cost much less money, or perhaps it can be avoided entirely. 
The second of the project management tools that are built into the MEC contract are the programming requirements. And we're going to look at that in a bit of detail with reference to clause three. Um, this contract revolves around the program. If you don't get the program right, if you don't work at it continuously in a collaborative way, the contract can run aground and it can run off the rails. So making sure you get the program right is probably the biggest takeaway of this evening. When you do get it right, however, the contract works very well because you use the program under the NEC to do what? What's the main thing you use the program for? Aside from the contractor, you know, knowing what work needs to be done in the next two weeks and getting everything procured. Aside from that, what do you think you use the program for under the NEC? Anyone? To quantify the impact, absolutely. To assess compensation events. Again, because we have this contract, which into the past should be an as-built record of what has happened, and into the future, a prospective projection of what needs to happen, you can cost both of those up. You can understand how much it was going to cost the contractor before the problem arose, and you can then forecast how much it's going to cost after. You take one of those things away from the other, the change in that in that quantity, that cost, is the value of the compensation event. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but at its bare bones, that's how the compensation event assessment mechanism works. And that's why the program is so important. So to clear away all of that red ink, again, we're looking at what the contract is all about. We're looking at how you put it together. And then we're starting to look at two of the things that make the NEC contract a little bit different to its contemporaries. So in terms of the starting assumptions here, and I apologize for the dog barking in the background. Again, we're still in the, the, the realm of Zoom here. Unfortunately, these things you can't control. Um, so in terms of the starting assumptions, I'm assuming that you have made the business case for using an NEC contract. Again, it's it's difficult to you know start anywhere but there. If you're going to go down the route of a JCT um, and you need to be convinced to use NEC, the best way to think of it is this. Why would you use the NEC suite? It's to save the client money. So what I mean by that is this. The NEC has got these project management tools built into it. And the theory of these project management tools is you have all of these difficult conversations as the project progresses. And that will save you having a very difficult and costly conversation at the end of the project. So to maybe illustrate what I mean by that, an NEC project should look like this. You know, you're trundling along, you have a little, you know, mini dispute between yourselves over the value of a compensation event, but you get it sorted at the time and you get it implemented. Time rattles on, you have a couple more of these little problems, you get to the end of the project and everybody can walk away, okay? Contrast that to the likes of a JCT contract, where traditionally these problems have a habit of just, you know, going all the way to the end of the project and having a large fight at final account stage. And the theory is when you get to this point, it's very, very difficult to unlock that, that dispute between the parties without recourse to the likes of adjudication or arbitration or court. Whereas under the NEC, because it has this collaboration at its core, because it requires you to assess compensation events on a very strict timeline as you go along, these problems should never be insurmountable. So that's the key use case for the NEC, in my opinion. It's to have the difficult conversations as you go along. It's to manage the, the project properly from the outset to avoid this scenario, where ultimately the only people that can unlock it are the people being paid the big fees at the end, which can be avoided with proper project management. So are there any questions on that? Just before I carry on, why you would use the NEC? So we've got a question here. Question number one, contractor notifies a compensation event and PM accepts it. That's always a good start and instructs the contractor to submit a quotation following the contract. PM is keen for the contractor to do the work immediately. Can the contractor state they will not start the work until the quote is accepted? I can give you a direct answer to that question. The contractor can't do that. Under clause 14.3, um, the PM can instruct a change to the scope, which I assume is what has happened here. And under 27.3, the contractor is required to follow it. 
to straightforward as that. They can't refuse and hold the program to ransom until the quote has been accepted. Um, and at the end of the day, if the contractor has provided a quotation to the project manager, it's up to the project manager to accept it or alternatively to make their own assessment. None of that is contingent upon the contractor um, because the contractor has to proceed under those two clauses. We'll come into that sort of that sort of topic into week two of this course. We'll be doing that next week, but hopefully that answers that um, very good question for now. So in terms of the NEC philosophy, so sort of building on what we were looking at on that previous slide with that little um, linear graph analogy. So the point of the NEC is to try to avoid that bun fight at the end of a project that can't be unlocked. And that's what this ultimately boils down to, that the philosophy was trying to cure these known ills of traditional contracts. And for reasons that we'll not get into, it has been highlighted over the years that the construction industry in the UK is very, very litigious. We like to fight with one another. And the NEC is trying to resolve that. That's one of its core tenants to try to mitigate those risks as we go along. In terms of how it does that, then we've got the three main points, which are flexibility, the fact that it's written in plain English, and the fact that it is a stimulus to good management. I'm going to touch on each one of those bullet points in subsequent slides, but just on the management point, I just want to really emphasize it because. In my opinion, it is what makes the NEC so good. It is what makes the NEC um, stand shoulders above its, its contemporaries. What I mean by good project management is the fact that it's got project management tools built into the contract. It's not just a contract to go and build you know, 10 widgets or whatever it happens to be. It's go and build 10 widgets surrounded by all of this project management machinery, such as the early warning mechanism such as the program under clause three, and such as the compensation event mechanism under clause six. And the fact that you have to assess change as you go along, looking at the, the question that came through there just on the, um, on the chat box, that is an exact problem that, that was faced with other contracts. The NEC doesn't have that because the compensation event mechanisms or compensation events are implemented as you go along. The contractor can't hold them to ransom. And all of that is just good, good practice. And that's what the NEC is built in between the two covers. We also have this, the fact that all of these obligations are underpinned with the requirement for the parties to act in a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. And recently, the courts in Scotland have put their shoulder behind that specific obligation. And they've confirmed that, you know, it's not just there. Um, it's not just written and something to be forgotten about. That clause has teeth, is what the court has recently said about that clause. So if you're not acting in a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation, there could be consequences. I don't like to look at this term in terms of the negatives. You know, there will be consequences if you don't cooperate. You shouldn't look at it in the negative sense like that. You should be looking at that in the positive sense to see what better. <clears throat> you can obtain from actually using a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. The likes of, again, the example that came through on the chat about the contractor not wanting to proceed, the best way to resolve that is to get both parties into a room to talk about it, to try to cooperate. You know, what is the problem with, um, with our quotation? Why are you not accepting it? Get those channels of communication, you know, right from the outset, and it will put the project in the right direction. It takes both parties to buy into that. If one party doesn't, it can become very difficult, but if both parties buy in, then the contract works very, very well. And at the end of the day, it's all about money. You know, we work and we live in a capitalist society. Money is what makes the wheels go round, rightly or wrongly. So the point is, all of the things on this slide are designed to save money. If you can work together, if you can have a contract that's written in plain English that doesn't require you to go to court every time you need something to be interpreted, that ultimately saves everybody money, apart from us lawyers, unfortunately. Um, but hey-ho, do myself out of the job. So in terms of what I mean by the flexibility point, so the one of the key things with the NEC is it's multidisciplinary. You can use an NEC contract at virtually any point in the supply chain. So maybe just to illustrate this on the slide with a fairly typical organogram for a construction project. 
So quite often the first contract that a client organization will procure is the agreement with the consultant to you know, specify the needs, depends on what stage the RIBA stage of work you're at or whatever stage of work you use. Um, but again, this would be a fairly early appointment to establish the business case, to take it up to the developed design stage or detailed design stage. You know, We all know what the consultants do there. We also have under the NEC4 suite, I'm just going to note that this is a new contract under the NEC4. This is the professional services subcontract, does what it says on the tin. If you're bringing in a specialist to design a retaining wall or whatever it happens to be, you've got a back-to-back -back contract there that will step down the obligations to that subconsultant. Again, in the same way that you'd be used to with a subcontract. We have one question here coming from Gordon. What happens if a subcontractor is risk averse and refuses to follow an instruction given by the contractor? The contractor is in breach of contract. So again, we'll maybe just skip through this just to look at this exact scenario here. So what you're saying, Gordon, is you've got a subcontractor working directly for a main contractor and they are refusing to perform. That is the risk of main contracting, folks. If your subcontractor doesn't perform, it would amount to a breach of their subcontract and you would have to potentially terminate and bring in a replacement. Again, that is always going to be the contractor's risk under the NEC. It's got nothing to do with Mr. or Mrs. Client at this point. It is up to the contractor to get their house in order to perform ultimately upstream. Um, it, it would potentially, and to answer your question directly, if this subcontractor caused the main contractor to go in through delay, then of course, it would be a breach of that main contract. It would be a breach, and that is the main contractor's risk for the reasons I've just said. Um, but before we get back onto the subcontract, this is the contract that we're looking at here this evening. This is the engineering or, or the engineering and construction contracts, the black book. As I say, this is the main form of contract between the client organization and the main contractor. And for the purposes of this evening, all of the clause numbers that I'm going to be referring to, I mentioned a couple earlier, Earlier, you know, the obligation of a PM or the ability of a PM to change the scope under 14.3 and the requirement or obligation on the contractor to follow that instruction. Again, all of those are clauses from the black book, the NEC for ECC. So as we jump ahead onto Gordon's question, you also have a subcontract form there, which again, is just a back-to-back -back contract. For example, under the main contract, the main contractor has eight weeks to notify a compensation event. Under the subcontract, the subby has seven weeks. You should prob probably be able to spot the utility in that. It's to allow the main contractor to pass on that compensation event notification if required. You know, using your example there, Gordon, if there is genuinely a compensation event under the subcontract, let's say, for instance, they've come across adverse physical conditions, ground conditions, and they might notify that as a CE under the subcontract. And the main contractor, assuming it has that CE and its main contract unamended, it would pass it up to the client. So again, because you're working on that back-to-back -back basis, the contracts talk to one another and they dovetail together quite neatly. And then finally, we also have the supplier contracts, which again are for the supply of goods effectively, which are slightly different in terms of how they're dealt with legally. Again, we talk about the Seal of Goods Act 1979. It's not a construction contract. So these are drafted in a slightly different way, but they all still speak the same language. They all speak the same mother tongue, which is the NEC mother tongue. There's a few other contracts that I'm not going to get into here. You've got the likes of the term service and the facilities management contract for dealing with maintenance. And the likes of myself, I'm a construction adjudicator. I'm dealing with a dispute at the moment between a contractor and a client organization. And one of the requirements is to appoint the adjudicator under the adjudicator's contract, which is also an NEC form. Um, so there's plenty of contracts in the suite, and the benefit is they all speak the same language, and it should ultimately lead to cost savings if everybody understands where their obligations lie. So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you get to understand what we mean then by that point of flexibility. We've got one further question here, which I'll, I'll deal with now before we move on. If there was a breach and the subcontract was terminated, would this have to be done under an agreed fee between the contractor and the subcontractor? 
No is the short answer to that. So under the NEC, like most other forms of construction contract, there are express termination provisions within it. And Naz, to answer your question, the termination provisions under the NEC, you'll find them in clause nine. And if you're terminating a subcontractor for default, in other words, the subcontractor isn't performing, and that's the reason that you're terminating, the NEC uses the word substantially failing to perform. If they've substantially failed to perform, then you can terminate. You have to give notices and all of that, so be very careful, but in theory, you can. If you decide to terminate the subcontractor for default for substantially failing to follow their obligations, then you have to work out how much money is going to change hands. And to answer your question, you don't have to agree the fee on that. The NEC sets out how you are to assess it and the contractor can assess it itself unilaterally. It would be a case of working out how much money the subcontractor is due for the work it's done. But you would then take away the extra amount of money that the subcontractor or the contractor is going to have to pay the replacement. And that would typically speaking outweigh the amount the contractor is due. And that would probably end up as a sum due back to the contractor in that scenario. The piece of advice I'll give on that is to be very, very careful with termination. You have to make sure you get it right. This is not a sales pitch. This is advice. Take good legal advice if you ever find yourself in that scenario, because if you get it wrong, it can come back to bite you. Um, good. There's a couple more questions there, but I'm just going to move on for the purposes of now. We'll maybe come back to those at the end just to make sure that we can get through the content, first of all. So the next point of why the NEC is different is the fact that it is written in plain English. So what I've done on this slide is copy and paste using the snipping tool uh, to compare and contrast the main obligation under the NEC with the equivalent provision under the JCT, Design and Build, which again is the equivalent of the NEC here. Immediately, you should be able to spot the difference. The NEC um, is very, very short in terms of, of, of how it defines obligations, almost to a fault. I'm not saying that this approach is absolutely perfect. Myself, as a lawyer, I can I can certainly see the cons of how, of how the NEC is drafted, but it's drafted very simply. It's drafted by civil engineers, by engineers, for other engineers to interpret. And again, there's there's a lot of benefit in that, but I do appreciate at the same time, there's another side to that coin. So as you can see here, all the contractor has to do in theory under the NEC is to provide the work in accordance with the scope. Okay, it's, it's, it's as broad as that. You'll see here that we've got capitalized words, capital P, capital W, capital S, I'm going to come on to that in the next slide, but the fact that those words are capitalized um, is important. It means those terms have a definition somewhere, and you'll find those definitions in clause 11.2. So the likes of to provide the works will go into more detail on what exactly that term means. So you have to read that term into that clause. And the same thing with the scope. You have to go away and look up what exactly the scope means um, um, from that perspective. Contrast that to the JCT, you know, it goes into detail on having to carry out the works in a proper and workmanlike manner. Again, the NEC stance on that is, well, what does that mean? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't automatically tell you what exactly it means. So let's take it out. In compliance with X, Y, and Z, the likes of the construction phase plan, again, linking it back to the CDM regulations, statutory requirements, etc. Again, it goes into quite a lot of detail on what exactly it means to do the job. Under the NEC, and what I'd always recommend to my clients that are drafting these things, is you need to get equivalent language, equivalent language into your scope to accurately define what exactly it means to provide the works. So yes, it's written in plain English. Yes, it's short, but you still need to do the work somewhere. And under the NEC, that work is done in drafting the scope. Um, there's a question, again, there's a couple of questions here just about breach of contract. We'll maybe just leave those to the end because they're all slightly off topic at the moment. Yeah, there's more questions on breach there. As I say, we'll come back to those just for the purposes of time. So the final point then on plain English, I mentioned this point before, when you see capital terms, that does mean something. It means that that term has got a corresponding definition 
in clause 11.2. And all of the NEC contracts are the same. So if you're flicking through a professional services contract or the subcontract or a supply contract and you see something in I um, capitalized, it means go and look up the definition. And I'd always recommend to look it up, don't make it up because those definitions are drafted for a particular purpose. In terms of formatting, there's another important thing to note, which again is quite particular to the NEC. I'm not familiar with any other contracts that, that do it in this way, and I think it's actually really good. And that is making things in italics. If you see something italicized, that means it is an identified term, and you have to go and look up what it means in the contract data. I'll come back to what the contract data is, but for now, just to summarize, it is the bits you fill in. Fill in. Contract particulars. For example, who is the employer? What's their name? Who is the project manager? How long have you got to respond to one another? What are the liquidated damages? What are the access dates? And so on and so forth. All of those things that are particular to a specific project have to go into the contract data. We're going to look at that document in a bit more detail shortly. And again, everything's drafted in the present tense. That's more just something stylistic, you know, to maybe go back and look at what that looks like here. It's all about the contractor provides the works. It's not the contractor shall, which again is into the future. It's just a little nuanced piece of drafting, which is slightly unusual, but worth noting. It's designed to make sure the person reading it knows what they have to do and when. That's why it's drafted in the present tense. And then finally, the point that we're going to be picking up in next week's session, all about change, um, is the fact that there's no claims or delay events or variations, loss and expense, all of those terms that you might have heard of before to do with the contractor getting more money or an extension of time. Again, they're all wiped out. The only term that we use to define that is a compensation event. And the special thing about a compensation event, which is different to most other contracts, I'd say almost all of the ones I can think of off the top of my head anyway, is that all of them are time and money. In other words, if a compensation event arises that causes delay and puts the contractor to extra expense, both of those things can be claimed. That is different to how most other forms of contract work because most other forms of contract have two different types of event. They have events which are time and money, the likes of a variation, for example, a change order, but they also have a separate category of event which are time only. The likes of weather, for example, under the likes of the JCT, you only get an extension of time for that if there's exceptionally adverse weather. Or, for example, um, strike, again, the likes of the problems we're having at the moment in England. If that causes a delay under the JCT, it will be time only. But again, the position might be different under the NEC, where it will be time and money. The, the biggest example of that, I suppose, is, is COVID. COVID-19. Back when that started to kick off in early 2020, it was triggering a compensation event under the NEC called the Prevention Compensation Event, and contractors under NEC were getting the time and the cost of any delay associated with that. But the very same problem, very same worldwide pandemic under the JCT was time only. Just goes to show you, contracts allocate risk in certain ways, in different ways. That's what a contract is for at the end of the day, to say, party A, you take this risk, party B, you take that risk. And that's what the NEC is all about, and any contract is all about. But what we're highlighting here is the fact that they allocate those risks differently. So you always have to be acutely aware of that. Good. Uh, Next point. So this is the final one, and this is the most important thing that makes the NEC different. And it is the fact that it has project management tools built into it. There is nothing to stop you using these tools under any other form of contract. You can you know, work together and you can draft in an early warning mechanism. You can have a program that you, know, you use as the basis for assessing change. You can do that under any contract. But the point is, the NEC has it by default. It has it written into the contract that the parties shall follow this early warning mechanism by default. Again, it's a project management tool written into the contract. The same thing applies to the program and compensation events as well, which, which heavily rely upon the program. 
could have that under any other form of contract, but under the NEC, they're written in as standard. And these are two of the things we're going to cover later on this evening. I'm going to talk you through how the early warning mechanism works, and we're going to look at the programming requirements of the contract. It's important to, to understand the programming requirements because it will set the scene for the lecture that we're doing next week, where we go through a worked example on how to take a compensation event all the way from spotting it and notifying it through to assessing it and getting it implemented. And that all revolves around the program. So you need to know the end of tonight's lecture to fully understand all of next week's lecture. And um, question there, the COVID, COVID interpretation, was it always the case or was it conveniently applied? Um, it depends when the contract was signed to, to answer that question. So the compensation event, and this is a good question, so I'm going to answer it now and it's, it's relevant for COVID-19, is the compensation event at 60.119 of the contract. If you have a copy of your contract and you go and look that up, you'll see that there is a four part test that has to be satisfied for that event to be triggered. And again, it's not about being conveniently applied. If the four points are ticked off, it should be applied. Point one is that an event has to happen that causes critical delay. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's what it boils down to. So critical delay. The second point is it has to um, have not been caused by either of the parties or neither party could have prevented it. So um, neither could prevent. COVID-19, did it cause critical delay? Clearly, yes, in 2020. Did it um, prevent or could either party have prevented it happening? No, absolutely not. The third part is that a reasonable contractor at the contract date, and that's a very important term, which is why I'm writing it down, and would not have made an allowance for it. And the fourth part of the test says it can't be any of the other CEs, which it wouldn't be in this scenario. So as I said in my initial review of that question, it depends on when it happened and when you signed the contract, because COVID clearly caused critical delay. It it could not have been prevented by either party, but would a reasonable contractor have allowed for it at the contract date? Well, if the contract date was in late 2019, when no one had any idea about COVID and you signed the contract at that point, then it would be triggered because no reasonable contractor could have made an allowance for it. Compare that position if you're signing a contract in the middle of 2020. Would that make a difference whenever COVID was, you know, at its peak or, or on its way to its peak? Do we think that would have made a difference? Would a reasonable contractor have made an alliance for COVID at that point? What do we think? It's not a black and white answer, but, but what's the, the prevailing answer? Yeah, I think they would have. They would have allowed something. So to, I hope that answers your question. It very much depends on when you signed it. There is one other question here I'm just going to answer. Is the NEC standard fixed contract clauses or can a legal professional adjust it, um, as is the case in Ireland with the RIAI? Um, you can change it if you want to. You can change any contract if you want to. Um, the only exception that I can really think of is the likes of the public works in Ireland. Ollie, if you're working under a public works contract in Ireland, it is off the shelf. You can go on to the CWMF website, download it and use it. But in the UK and in the private sector and in Ireland as well, contracts will almost always be amended. It's, it's a very large part of what I do is reviewing the contract Z clauses to see how these contracts have been amended and to ultimately advise the client on how that impacts the standard contract and to tell them what extra risks have been passed to them. So um, it's not standard. You can certainly change it. I would always advise against going over the top with your changes. Some changes are necessary, but quite a lot of them are just, you know, quite frankly, unwarranted and shouldn't be there. But you have to read it, unfortunately. And um, what is the explanation of point four? So I assume you mean the explanation of this point. Yeah, is that right? Uh, and um, I suppose the, the reason we have that point there is just to explain that they don't use any of the standard terminology that you might be used to, such as claims or variations. Everything that will entitle the contractor to more money or more time will be triggered by a compensation event. 
that's what that point means unless it's a remeasurable form and you work off the, the basis of a bill of quantities subject to that the only time you get more money is via the compensation event mechanism good so hopefully all of that's starting to to come together nicely as i say the biggest thing in my opinion that sets the nec apart is the fact that it's got these project management tools built in and that's what we're going to be looking at through the remainder of this evening the final point I'll make, you know, I probably do sound like an NEC evangelist, and I am to an extent, but I do recognize at the same time that it is not perfect. The I, I see quite a lot of client organizations naively hearing about the NEC in the news and thinking it is the panacea that will cure all of the problems that they face dealing with these contractors in the past. It will not do that. You need to have the right team involved. You need to have a project manager, most importantly, that understands how to operate the contract. The project manager role in this contract is not simply to turn up and certify payment. They have to proactively manage the, the contract and proactively manage the early warning mechanism, the, the compensation event mechanism and the program. So you need someone that is NEC trained, that understands how to work it. That is always your starting point. If you don't have that, if you've got, you know, Joe Blogs that's never ran an NEC in their life, you're going to face the same problems that you've always faced. That's a real life experience talking there. The next point, which applies to any other form of contract as well, is that you need to have the scope, right? A job is only as good as the documents. You can only expect a contractor to hold their price if you have defined the scope perfectly. If that scope needs to change, it's going to lead to a compensation event. It could lead to arguments. So getting the scope right is well worth the investment. If you can spend one extra pound of effort getting the scope right, it will save you 10 pounds of effort trying to resolve the disputes on the site. Again, that's an exponential relationship there. It has to be right. And then finally, both parties have to work together. You know, if one party just decides, you know what, I'm going to ignore this compensation of a, um, mechanism. That'll lead to the project manager not doing their job. The parties will you know, start to generate friction between one another, and it takes you back to the same place that you would have been in had you used any other form of contract. So all three of those things have to be working for you. The project manager needs to know their, their stuff. The scope needs to be right, and both parties need to buy in to the ethos of the contract, which is working together. I did a NEC training session to a primary school project down in the southeast of England a couple of years ago, and it was the client organization, the, the school that was driving the NEC. And I'll never forget it, the, the client sponsor, again, the main man on the client side, he got up and he put on a PowerPoint presentation, and it was of a video of a man dancing in the middle of a, of a festival, just by himself. Yeah. But then as the, the video started to roll on, everybody around him started to dance, and then by the time the video ended, 100 people were dancing in the field, and everybody was having a good party. The reason he showed that is because it takes that person to, you know, to put energy into the team, to make sure that everybody wants to work together, to get the energy level at the right place so that everybody can buy into this contract so that it will work. If you have someone that just works in the negative, that always sees the glass half empty, NEC is probably not going to work too well. A okay, bit of a convoluted story, but it really does hold true. Because when it does work well, it works extremely well, it will save money, it will save effort, you'll be able to, you know, have that really good working relationship, move on to the next project, make money on it as well. But by the same token, if it doesn't work, it is an absolute disaster. See, I work as an adjudicator, I work as a party representative in dispute resolution trying to unpick an NEC project that has went wrong, trying to unscramble that egg is a very, very difficult thing to do. And um, it's great for me, lots of fees involved, but having to, to go back and figure out what the program was at the time the compensation event arose, using that program to assess the impact of the compensation event, revising the program again to counteract the fact that some CEs would have been critical but are now subcritical because you implemented the first one. Again, those problems are difficult to resolve. So if you don't get these three things right, it can be a disaster waiting to happen. So 
that concludes sort of the first segment of this evening. You know, why is this contract different? Are there any questions before we get into looking at what's under the hood of this contract? Are we all good? 168 here this evening, which is a great number, learning about the NEC. Of the 168, was there any questions before we get going? No? Good. We'll batter on then. So in terms of the structure of this contract, as I said at the start, we're looking at the engineering and construction contract. This is the main form of contract between an employer or client, to use the NEC word, or, and the contractor, the main contractor. In terms of the main documents that make up this contract then, we have the terms and conditions, which hopefully um, speak for themselves. That's where you go to find um, clause 20.1, which requires the contractor to do the work. That's where you go to find everything about how you deal with defects, how you get paid. Some of the questions earlier, we're looking at termination. You'll find all of that good stuff within the, um, the contract terms themselves. Aside from that, we have got a couple of other ancillary documents to the contract terms that are vitally important. The first of which is the contract data. This, as I said earlier, is the bit that you fill in. That's where you get, you literally get a copy of it and you fill in. Um, if you want to in wet ink, that's fine. Most people will normally prepare a word version of it. That's the preferable way to do it. Um, but you will fill in all of the contract details. Whenever the contractor is returning their tender bid, they'll fill in the second part of the contract data. You put both of those things together, which makes the contract data whole. And that is the contract forming at that point. And um, I'm going to look at that in a bit more detail, but that's what it is conceptually. The next document that we have is going to be referred to in the contract data. So the contract data has a part on the second or third page, which sets out where you will find the scope. And the scope is the most important document in all of this. You know, you could argue either way, but in my opinion, the most important document under the NEC is the scope. If you haven't properly specified what you want the contractor to build and the constraints within which they must build it, you know, are you giving them possessions? When are you giving those possessions? What are their working hours? Um, what's the boundaries of the site? Again, all of those things have to be defined within the scope. So spend 10 extra units of effort to save a thousand units of effort later down the line, to use that analogy from earlier. Um, but that's what we mean by the scope. Just in case anybody in the audience is still using NEC3, and again, Mark, you've just mentioned, would NEC3 still be used? And um, that is what was formerly known as the works information or the works info. You might hear quite a lot of people still talking about that. Definitely spelt wrong. Um, works information, NEC3, scope, NEC4. They do the same thing and fulfill the same function. Mark, to answer your question, um, yes, I am still seeing a couple of NEC3 contracts. It's becoming less and less, thankfully. And the NEC3 works. There's, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. There's nothing has happened in the law, really, that, that says you shouldn't use it. You know, the clauses all still comply with the law for the most part. But at the end of the day, um, the NEC was revised in 2017 for a reason. Um, a couple of quality of life improvements, uh, a massive one, which we're going to come on to shortly, revolves around that schedule of cost component. Um, there's been extra clauses added that people were always adding in as a Z clause, which so should streamline the administration of the contract and preparing it. So in my opinion, there's no real reason to continue using NEC3, but there's nothing to stop you at the same time. Um, GB region, I'm assuming that's you, um, Philip, talking about colleagues and the works information and the scope, they mean the same thing. People still talk about works information, but under NEC4, it's the scope you should be referring to. It's just a change in terminology. Um, and the point of that change in terminology is the word scope is used in the other NEC contracts, the likes of the PSC. So it's just to align the language so that they're all using the same word, you know, there's nothing wrong with works information. I still probably prefer that term, but same thing. Uh, the next document that's important to draft and to get right, especially, again, I appreciate I'm preaching to civil engineering colleagues um, to get right is the site information, because the site information defines what is on the site and ultimately what the contractor is deemed to have allowed for with respect to the physical conditions, with respect to the ground conditions. I'm just going to write in three clauses 
in beside this because these are the three clauses that refer to the site information in a big way. 60.112 is the compensation event for when the ground is much worse than you should have allowed for, again, ground conditions, compensation event. But you also have 60.2 and 60.3. You need to read all three of those clauses together to understand how to interpret the site information. When you read all of them together, it basically sets out for the purposes of pricing the physical conditions on the site and understanding what the contractor should have allowed for. The contractor is deemed to have taken into account everything in the site information, everything referred to in the site information, anything which could have been obtained from a visual inspection and anything else a reasonable contractor should have or be expected to obtain. That's that's pretty much exactly what clause 60.2 says. So take into account the site information and everything that goes with that basically. 60.3 then sets out what happens if there is a ambiguity or a inconsistency within that document. So you might have one part of the site info borehole survey from Joe Bloggs Limited that says you can expect to find nice soft limestone on this site that you know you can rip out with the with a backhoe should be nice and easy but another document which is a borehole log from 10 years ago has got very very different data and it says that the limestone is two or three hundred megapascals that you can't break out so which of those is the contractor deemed to have priced under 60.3 the contractor is deemed to have priced the most favorable one that's what the contract says in its unamended form i'd quite often see that clause being tweaked and being played with with a with a nasty z clause to change that position but that's how ground conditions are dealt with so looking at the site information, if you thought the ground was going to be nice and soft and easy to rip out the limestone, but then you get to the site and it turns out it's very hard, then that's when that compensation event will be triggered. And that's that's how all of those, those clauses and documents work together. The fourth and final document on the screen here, again, is a really, really important document that, in my opinion, Quite a lot of people just don't understand. If, if, they're, if you're new to NEC, this is something that will be very new to you. And that document is what we call the schedule of cost components. There's two of them. There's a long one and there's a short one. And um, we'll get into the difference between them later. But for now, let's just put them all together under that term schedule of cost components. What that document does is it sets out eight different headings. and for the contractor to claim more money as part of a compensation event, their claim has to fall into one or more of those eight categories. For example, if you're claiming for additional money for adverse ground, having to spend more time in the ground, bring in bigger gear. You would claim under heading one, your labor. You would claim under heading two, the additional equipment that you had to bring in. And let's say you had to bring in more concrete for whatever reason you would claim that under heading three, which is materials, plant and materials. Um, so again, all of the costs have to be filtered in and find themselves on that list. If they do not work their way onto that list, or if they're not on the list at all, then you can't claim it, at least not directly anyway. You would only be able to claim it through what we call the fee which we work out by applying a percentage to the total of everything that ends up on that list. Okay, the total is what we call defined cost. So let's say everything on that list of eight, of eight points adds up to 100 grand. We call that the defined cost of the, of the event. You then apply a 10% fee percentage on top of that. What's the total value of the compensation event? 100 grand defined cost multiplied by 1.1% to uplift it. For the fee, what is that? Clearly, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. We're all intelligent engineers here that can do mathematics. 110K. And that's how you work out the value of a compensation event. You do it with reference to the schedule of cost components. As I say, at its bare bones, it's as basic as that, but you can then start to overcomplicate it when looking at the different percentages available. And Mark was mentioning there about why would you not use the NEC3? Well, this is a reason that you probably shouldn't, because under the NEC3, this whole exercise 
is quite convoluted. There's different percentages to be applied to some of the different headings. There's only seven headings. You have to do everything again for subcontractors under the NEC4. Quality of life improvement, it is dramatically simplified. It's one of the biggest differences, in my opinion, under the NEC4. Um, and to answer your question, just on the on the blower there, the fee percentage is set at the start of the contract. The contractor will give you a fee percentage as part of their tender response. Um, we have a big question coming in there. Again, I see public works and all being thrown into it. We'll come back and we'll we'll deal with that one just at the end, Andrew. So contract data then, um, as I say, this is the bits that you fill in. Contract data part one provided by the client, contract data part two by the contractor. Both of those things together um, are the contract data and you need both parts for the contract to work ultimately. In terms of what you get from the client at tender stage, I suppose that's a point in its own right. This half of the contract data is what the client would prepare when preparing the tender. And they would give contract data part one to the contractors that they're inviting for, for a bid. And they would give them contract data part one at tender stage. This part is part of the contractor's bid then. That's what they give in response to contract data part one. So as you can see here, um, again, it's, it identifies what exactly the contract is. Are there any amendments to the contract? What are the main options? What are the secondary options? So again, it actually identifies the T's and C's, and that's the first thing. It identifies those documents that we've just considered before, what the scope is, what the site information is, and it gives all of that particular information you need for the contract to operate, dates, timings, etc. Contract data part two is much more straightforward and it's the commercial end of the contractor's bid. It's probably the simplest way to think of it. And what they will include is the fee percentage. So we had that question there a moment ago. Is it included at the start of the contract? Yes, it is. And it will be put into contract data part two. Let's say 10%. Um, the next thing is, you know, the key thing is the tender total of the prices. So if you've got a activity schedule, it'll be the total of your activity schedule. If you've got a bill of quantities, it'll be the total of your bill of quantities. And that's what we call the tender total of the prices. It's a contract price at the end of the day. The third and final thing here is, is something that we just touched on in the last slide. It's what we call the data for the schedule of cost components. So as I said on the previous slide, the schedule of cost components is eight different headings. You use those eight different headings to work out the value of compensation events. In terms of, of these eight headings, it's just a list and you have to figure out whether or not the cost falls onto the list. If it does, you, you then need to figure out what rate do you apply to it. So for instance, under heading one, you can recover the cost of your site staff. You can recover the cost of your contracts manager who doesn't work on the site, but goes to the site one day a week. Both of those things are captured under heading one. The next thing you have to do is work out, well, how much is the site agent worth? How much is the contracts manager worth per hour? Say, you know, 90 or 90, um, pounds, whatever it happens to be, and you then multiply that by the time they're on the site. And that's how you build up the cost of a compensation event. That is different to most other forms of contract that don't have anything like this. They don't require you to break down your cost in a certain way. They don't have rates, perhaps, agreed in this particular format as part of the tender bid. All of that is very useful information for helping to manage the contract. Uh, couple more questions there, Laura, depending on what clause it falls or if more than one, the percentage varies. Uh, under the NEC4, no, there's only one percentage. You only have a single fee percentage under the NEC4. Doesn't matter whether it's a change in scope or ground conditions, it's 10% or whatever it happens to be for all of them. Um, I do agree that, that that does make it difficult to price that percentage, but that's just a facet of the NEC that it has to be priced accordingly. Uh, question from Michael, good question. Does anything happen to your contractor who, who fails to notify an early warning? Yes, and um, if they fail to notify an early warning that a reasonable contractor should have, then there will be repercussions. We have that later on this evening, I think, but it's clause 61.5 and 63.7 that we'll look at. And I'll come back onto that later because we do cover it. Uh, Peter, if 
detailed site information is not provided by the client, does this tend to increase compensation and impact and frequency? Uh, it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, that, because to be able to claim compensation under the compensation event, um, ground conditions clause or the ground conditions compensation event clause you have to prove that the the ground is worse than what it says in the site information so if you have limited site information it can actually be difficult to prove that so it, it can actually be more difficult to establish a claim if you've got less site information in terms of how the market should treat that however if the market is being given very limited site information what should they be allowing for in terms of risk in the ground as part of their tender price? In theory, they should be they should be increasing that, shouldn't they? Which is the thing that should counteract a client wanting to give as little site information as possible. So, so it is a double-edged sword, that one, unfortunately. Uh, Andrew Campbell, the staff hourly rate, including the CE, must only be the hourly rate, including the model compensation with the tender. Yes, so... As part of this component here, to stop contractors simply putting in whatever rate they want at tender stage, the client organizations will often tie those rates to the competition itself. And they often do that with a thing called a model compensation event. So they will basically say at tender stage, we're going to award this to the person that is the cheapest, and we will work out the cheapest based on this calculation. It would normally be something like your contract price plus the value of your model compensation event, which you would have maybe, say, a thousand units of someone's time, thousand units of concrete. You know, you're, you're making up arbitrary figures here. But the point is, against those arbitrary figures, you have to apply your rate. And if your rates are high, that increases the value of the model compensation event, which you add on to your price and will make you less competitive. So, so to answer your question, you only use those rates and they will probably be the rates from the model compensation event. Uh, Alexandros, you get an interesting question, which is a very niche one, but I'll, I'll deal with it now before moving on. Can a neighboring third party um, whose assets are now in worse condition than informed by the client fall under a CE. So I think what you're saying is the scope document has set out that the road, the access road, for example, will be capable of taking a certain size of machine, something like that. If that turns out to be incorrect, then that should probably give rise to a compensation event. If it's defined within the scope, it would give rise to a compensation event on the basis that you would have to change it. Because it's in worse condition, you would have to go and get an instruction to change that scope and it would give rise to a CE that way. If the same thing is set out within the site information and you, know, you get to the site and it turns out the lien is worse than anticipated, it would probably be a compensation event under that ground conditions clause at 60.112. So I think that answers your question. It's a little bit more niche. If it hasn't, sure, feel free to drop me a line and we can deal with it. But moving swiftly on. Conditions of contract then. So the way I always explain um, the conditions of the NEC, it's like booking a flight with EasyJet. Appreciate that sounds a little bit odd, but, but bear with me. So when you book a flight with EasyJet, the first thing you do on the website, is or any airline is pick the destination and that's the first thing you do with the NEC you pick the contract that you want here we're using the NEC for ECC and by selecting that contract you have now given yourself a selection of core clauses that apply regardless of everything else we're about to look at for example the ECC sets out when the contractor will be paid. It sets out when the parties can terminate one another. It sets out where the risks lie between the parties in terms of those compensation events. And you do that by simply selecting the destination, selecting the NEC4 contract. What's the next thing that happens when you book a flight with EasyJet? After you've picked your destination, what do you then get asked? Again, just to get a bit of feedback in the room. Well, you're asked to pick insurances. You're asked whether or not you want to book a hotel. Again, all these optional extras are, are the things you get to pick whenever you're booking a flight. And that's exactly what you have to do with the NEC. Once you've selected your main option, once sorry, once you've selected your core contract, you then have to tailor it. 
And you do that, first of all, by selecting the main option clause. The point is you have to select one of these. You can't have an NEC without selecting a main option. It just doesn't work. Physically does not work. Commercially does not work. Um, so, for example, if you want to have a lump sum contract where it's very straightforward work, you might select option A. It's the most straightforward form of NEC. The contractor is told, I want you to build me a bridge and give me your best price for it. That's what an option A looks like. Or let's say, for instance, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So you have got your bridge designed by your team of consulting engineers. You've got a professional PQS to come in and to draw up a bill of quantities. Well, you would use that bill of quantities and you would give it out to the market. And the market will then price the bill and return their price. If you want to go down that route, having a remeasurable form of contract, that's an option B. And that's when you would select it. The other forms of contract are slightly different then. Option C and D are what we call the target cost contracts. Again, they're not lump sum like the others. If the contractor is able to beat their tender price, they get to share in that saving. But by the same token, if they go over the tender price, over the target, then they have to share in that overspend and that pain. Um, a couple of other acronyms or, or initials here on the screen. AS means activity schedule and BOQ means bill of quantities, just to make sure I've explained that. The final two forms are cost reimbursable forms of contract. In other words, doesn't matter how much it costs, the contractor gets paid their costs plus, plus the fee on top of that. So there's no risk on, on the contractor at that point, apart from um, meeting the programme. There will still be a completion date that has to be met. And normally if they don't, it will attract liquidated damages. But aside from that, the contractor gets paid everything in getting there. A uh, couple of minor questions. Uh, da, 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 da. Is there ever a time the project manager could arrange for someone else to correct a contractor's defect and charge them for it accordingly? Yes, under clause four of the NEC, you have to give the contractor the ability to come back and correct the defect within the defects correction period. If they don't come back and fix it, then the contractor, or sorry, the client can bring in someone else and charge the contractor accordingly. You can absolutely do that, Michael. Um, again, we'll get through those other questions. I'm just conscious of the time that we're at here at the moment. So um, once you have selected your core clause, you've selected your main option, again, transferring the risk of the prices between the parties. Again, is it lump sum or is it not is, is the main question there. You then have to go on and to select a dispute resolution clause. This one is dead straightforward. If you're working in the mainland UK, this part, then you use the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act. Again, it's a piece of law that you have to use in, in the mainland UK. And that piece of law sets out that you can adjudicate at any time. And that's how W2 is drafted. If anybody is working in Northern Ireland, we have a slightly different version of that, a devolved version, but it does virtually the same thing. And if anybody is working in the Republic of Ireland, they've got something slightly different. It's called the CCA, Construction Contracts Act 2013. It does virtually the same thing as what the UK law does, um, but it's much newer and slightly different. So this part's dead easy. If you're working in the UK, mainland UK, then you select W2. The um, Peter, yes, Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act applies in Scotland, mainland UK, Scotland, England and Wales. Northern Ireland is the only funny bit. We'll not get into the reasons why. There's a very, very nuanced difference to do with dates ending on a Sunday, but we'll not get into that. The secondary option clauses then, and I actually wrote the clause, I forgot to give myself a sales pitch there, I actually wrote the NEC W2 clause for use in Northern Ireland, which is due to be published within the next week or two. So hopefully by the end of this course, I'll be able to share a link to the NEC website to share that with you. And the final thing that you do then, once you've selected your main option clause, the final thing is to select what we call the secondary options. So these are the frills. These are all of the little extra things that you don't necessarily need on every project, but if you want it, you can bolt it on. Again, it's like this flight to EasyJet. You'll not always need insurance, but if you're going somewhere dodgy, you might just want to add it on. And that's the exact same thing that you do with the X clauses.
We're going to go through some of those in a bit of detail, just kind of flag up some of the ones to be aware of. And um, there's quite a lot of options there. You don't have to have every single X clause selected, um, but I'm going to look at some of the more prevalent ones that I would see. We also have the secondary option Y clauses. So these are Y UK clauses, and that's how you'll see them written into the contract. Obviously, that means they are UK specific. So, for example, if you're working in the UK and you want to set up a project bank account, which is basically, that's what it says on the tin, the bank account for the project, where all of the client money is paid into the bank account, contractor can take their bit, subcontractor can take their bit. There is a off the shelf clause for that, and that's YUK1. YUK2. Again, links to the fact that if you're working in the UK, you have to work in accordance with the UK legislation. And this Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act, it requires payment terms of con construction contracts to work in a very specific way. So to align the payment terms of the NEC with the UK legislation, you have to use YUK too. If you're working in Ireland, for example, there is a clause YIR which I also assisted drafting with the NEC drafters that aligns the payment terms of the NEC with the payment terms under the Construction Contracts Act in the Republic of Ireland. There's one for Australia, there's one for New Zealand, I think there's one for South Africa. And um, again, the point is they update the contract to make them work in the jurisdiction they're, they're being used in. And then finally, YUK3, which again, we'll not get into, it's a, another piece of UK legislation called the um, Third Party Rights Act, and whether or not it is triggered, but it's a bit more specialist, so we'll not get into that. Finally, 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 we have the Z clauses. Does anybody know what a Z clause is? Just, I've done enough talking on this slide, just to open that up to the audience. Does anybody know what a Z clause is? We used or come across these in the past. Anybody want to jump onto the microphone or put something into the chat box? <laughs> Pat uh, said, amendments? Yeah, they're the contract amendments, Paul. And um, as Pat says, Z clauses are the nuisance clauses. Uh, they're a nuisance for most people, but for me as a construction lawyer, that's where I make my money, reading the things and drafting the things. Um, but you're dead right. They are the, the contract amendments. So if your client, for example, doesn't want to take the risk of growing conditions. You would go in via a Z clause. You would go to clause 60.112, which makes physical conditions a client risk. And what would you do to it? You get a big red pen and you put a stroke through it. And that's how you would do that. You would draft up a Z clause that would say clause 60.112 is deleted. Or you, know, you would go in and delete some of the other compensation events if you want. You can do anything you want with a Z clause. Um, the equivalent to the ICE particular conditions, yeah, Peter, to an extent, um, if you're looking at the likes of FIDIC as well, the specific conditions, again, there's, there's, there's different contracts use different words, but they mean the same thing. So final part, or the next part that we'll cover here this evening, we're not quite there yet, is a little bit more on the main option selection. So I briefly touched on this on the last slide. And the first point that I made was this, that you need to select one of these. The NEC contract does not work unless you have a main option. So that's, that's the entry point to understanding all of this. What these main option clauses do in terms of, you know, for broad brush purposes, is they allocate the pricing risk between the parties and dictate the payment mechanism. So for example, if you have a priced contract with an activity schedule, it transfers the risk of the pricing to the contractor. So that's what we're about to go in and explain here. If you have an option B, it doesn't transfer all of the risk to the contractor. The contractor still takes the risk of the rates that they use in the bill of quantities, but the client will take the risk of the quantity itself. So if it goes up or down, the, the contractor will be paid accordingly. And again, that's what I mean by allocating the, the pricing risk. And I'm gonna use a couple of little um, annotated slides here to show you how it also dictates the payment mechanism. So starting, first of all, with an NEC option A, priced contract with an activity schedule, the lump sum version of the NEC. 
So this is what a activity schedule looks like. Again, I've just give you a very simple example here. It could run into hundreds of lines, thousands of lines long, but at its core, this is what it is. It is a list of activities. Funnily enough, activity schedule that um, the contractor plans to do in carrying out the works. And what the contractor will do as part of their tender return is put a lump sum price against each of these activities. The contractor can, can draft the activity schedule if it wants. It can add extra lines onto it. If you're a client organization to allow you to compare tender bids, you would often give you know, summary line items. So substructure, superstructure, external works, that sort of thing. And for the simple purpose of allowing you to compare tender bids, but in theory, the contractor drives their activity schedule because they're the only one that knows what activities are needed. So this is the point. Those lump sum figures that you can see on the screen, the 10 grand figures here for the earthworks, the drainage, the concrete and the steelwork, those are the contractor's risk. So what happens if the earthworks ends up costing the contractor 50 grand? If, you know, it's a very wet day, subject to it being a compensation event, which probably wouldn't be. If it ends up just costing more money than anticipated, whose risk is that? That is a question. Contractor has to pay, absolutely. And um, because that is how this contract option works, and that is how the the allocation of risk here works. It all lies with the contractor. So as you can see here, the total of all of those activities is the total of the prices. That is the contract sum effectively to use you know, old money. The second thing that the main option selection does is dictate the payment mechanism. So what we mean by that is this. Let's look at each monthly interval here to see how much the contractor is due to be paid under an option A. So here we've got the contractor completing the earthworks and half of the drainage in month one. What is the contractor due to be paid at the end of that month? So at this point in time, the PM will draw a line in the sand and they will make an assessment and they'll pay the contractor sometime thereafter. So Kieran says 10,000, Ian says 10,000. Both obviously know the NEC. There's normally at least one person says 15. And um, you're exactly right, gents. Under the option A, you only get paid for activities which are complete. OK, you don't pro rata. You don't work on a percentage basis. The question the PM has to answer is, is it complete or not? Yes or no. And if it is, then it, it falls due for payment as part of that monthly cycle. This little acronym is, is another one just to note. This is the price for work done to date. And that is a, is a definition under the NEC that changes depending on what option you're using. So if you're using an option A, the definition of that term is, is the activity complete? You only get paid for acti activities which are complete. And um, we'll see how that definition changes shortly when we look at option B. So what's the total... Um, price for work done to date at the end of month two, then I'm not going to insult your intelligence. Obviously, it'll be 30k less what's been paid to date. And again, taking away anything else, maybe there's liquidated damages and retention, and the contract will be certified and paid that amount. End of month four, obviously 40k. Question from Brian I've got an NEC3 option A, but used a bill of quantities from the main contractor. What happened? His bill of quantities was way off on a few items. Well, I think fundamentally what you've done here, you know, you have this extra column within your pricing document here because it was based on a bill of quantities, which will have, you know, or maybe two columns, the unit price and the rate. If you're going full option A, you would just be paid the lump sum activity there. Brian is my suspicion. It sounds like it's maybe not been put together perfectly, so it might not be that way. But based on what you're saying, you, you, you're you only ever going to be paid the line item, not subject to remeasure if you've gone option A, is my, is my suspicion. I'm not sure that's what you want to hear or not. Which takes us neatly on then to looking at option B. So we've done the exact same thing here. We've got a little extract using the exact same, you know, uh, breakdown of the work, earthwork, strange concrete steel work, but we've got it in a bill of quantity format. So the risk is slightly different here between the parties and how it's been allocated. The employer will retain the risk of the quantities. 
So Brian, to use your example, if if you were NEC option B, that quantity risk would still have laid with the employer or perhaps the um, the main contractor in your circumstance. It's the same thing under the subcontract. It's a retained risk by the employer here. The only thing the contractor takes the risk of are the rates. So if the quantity of work goes up, Earthworks now requires an extra thousand cube of whatever it happens to be, thousand meters of this, then again, they'd be paid that at the appropriate rate. And um, one of the points we'll touch on next week, there are a couple of extra compensation events that go along with an option B to set out what happens if the quantities change dramatically. Let's say, for instance, you know, here we've got a thousand units of this Earthworks, you know, would the employer be able to hold you to the same rate if they only needed 10 units instead of a thousand? Do you think? Do you think that would be fair? Do you think your rate was on the basis of only providing 10 units? You don't have the same economies of scale, perhaps? Do you think it would be fair to adjust that rate? What do we think? Uh, no, Anthony Morrow, you're saying it, it would not be fair to adjust the rate. Maybe I phrased that in a slightly different way. Pat, you're saying yes. It would be fair to adjust the rate is what I'm saying. And that's what the contract and um, the way the contract is drafted. If you go to clause 60.4 to 60.7 of the contract, there are additional compensation events that relate to the bill of quantities. And the one at 60.4 says, um, if the rate changes by a certain amount, then a compensation event is triggered. And it goes in and it sets out very specifically what I mean by a, by a certain amount. It's got a, a 0.5% test in there to say when that will be triggered. So say, we'll maybe touch on that a bit more next week is a bit um, more detailed for the purposes of this slide than what we want to cover. Uh, good. Next point then, in terms of, so that's the first point I'm making there, it's just about how the risk has been allocated. It's slightly different to option A. It's slightly more shared between the parties here. In terms of the payment mechanism, it is also different because how much in this scenario would the contractor be paid? What would the price for work done to date be here under an option B? Do you think it would still be 10 grand? Nope, it's the 15. Slightly different under bill of quantities. It's the total quantity of work done in the given month. Again, yeah, moving forward. Um, less retention, less liquidated damages, whatever it happens to be. Uh, conscious of time, Philip, I appreciate that. We're probably going to cut the slides a little bit short tonight and we'll get into them um, next week. So don't worry about that. Good. Moving on then, again, as you can see here, marching through, price of work done today would be 30K at the end of month two, and obviously 40 at the end of month three. Final point then, on to secondary option clauses. And apologies, my slides seem to have frozen slightly. There we go. Um, so what we we're mentioning there, we're looking at the main option selection. Point was, you have to select one of them. We're now looking at the secondary option selection. And the way I described this was, you know, booking that flight with the EasyJet and, you know, tailoring the contract to your specific needs. So you've got 22 different secondary option clauses. In fact, you now have 23 because there's a new one, which is option X29 to do with climate change that we'll touch on briefly. And um, we'll look at all of them, you know, in a helicopter view on the next slide. But these are some of the ones that I would commonly see being put into contracts at the moment, or, or almost always. The likes of inflation, for example, because inflation is currently taking off, or it's maybe flatlining at this point, it's already took off, is, is so variable at the moment. Contractors are not wanting to take that risk anymore. And the way that they will pass that risk back to a client is by having option X1 optioned into the contract. And again, and that's, that shows you how exactly secondary options work. The same with X2. If you want to transfer the risk of the law changing back to the client, then you would have to bring in option X2, because if you don't have it in, the risk lies with the contractor. And again, this is the sort of concept that secondary option clauses are all about, transferring risk or adding risks to one party that it wouldn't otherwise lie with. 
Delay damage is very common. And um, what happens when you've got a design element, you know, limiting the contractor's responsibility to using reasonable skill and care. That's what X15 is all about. X16, retention, limiting your liability. Again, all of these things that you would commonly see in most other contracts, you actually have to option them in specifically under the NEC. So it's just something to be aware of. As I say, that's the helicopter view of all of these secondary option clauses. I'm not going to go through all of them for the purposes of this evening. We've only got two or three minutes left. We'll, we'll, we'll probably cut ourselves a little bit short this evening, um, but we're certainly not going to go through all of them. The two that I just want to maybe touch on briefly, because they are fairly topical, is X1. And the other polar extreme is kind of funny, um, X29, which is trying to protect the polar climates. And um, as I say, we're going to touch on these in a bit of detail, but do, if you have any questions on any of the other secondary options, feel free to drop me a line. So in short, the way X1 works is it adjusts the contract price and every one of the contractor's payments as you go along based on inflation up to the date of the payment itself. So you basically draw a line in the sand at the date you enter into the contract and at that line in the sand, you go away and you look up the cost of X, Y, and Z. Or more specifically, you look up the relevant index for X, Y, and Z, and you fix them. Let's say they're fixed at 1.0. It's a totally arbitrary number. Um, because that's what indices are. They are totally arbitrary. Then whenever you get to payment one, payment two, et cetera, you have to adjust all of the contractor's payments based on the, the relevant change and, and the relative change in that indice. So in month one, there's been 1% inflation. Your index has now increased to 1.01. .01. Then the contractor gets paid 1% extra on all of its payments. Let's say you get to the final payment. Inflation is now at 1.17. The contractor is now being paid 17% extra. And that's how the, broadly speaking, how this mechanism works. The contract data input for this, so this does require a little bit of work on the part of the client organization to fill in what all of these indices are. So the way you do that is by looking up the relevant index for different parts of the work. So, for example, labor and supervision, concrete, fuel, whatever it happens to be, steel work. And you can build up a project specific index that you're going to use to adjust all of the payments moving forward. So for example, if your contract is very, very heavily reliant upon steel work, you might want to heavily weight that index more so than the rest. Or if it's you know heavily reliant upon concrete, you would do the same there. So you do get the ability to um, adjust to make your specific index project specific. The next question that you might have is, where do we get these indices? Well, you can get them from a number of different sources. The RICS publish their own building and construction and indices, and that's probably one of the best resources you could get. And the government still does or used to publish their own sets. It doesn't really matter. And you could use, if you really wanted to, the likes of RPI the retail price index or CPI, the consumer price index. But at the end of the day, those indices don't chart construction that well. The cost of you know, your iPhone or whatever it happens to be is not accelerating at the cost of um, you know, timber boards, which are now double the price that they used to be last year. So you, know, you want to come up with an index that is construction specific. Um, I think that answers the final question just in, in the chat box there. What inflation data do you use? You get to use whatever data you want. And um, there's a question about that as well to Craig Porter. Um, yes, this is a double-edged sword. So if inflation goes down, the contractor will be paid less. Okay, You take the risk at the date the contract is signed, and that can therefore go up or down. So I'm not going to go through this next bit. This is just a worked example. You know, I pulled together some indices here from back in the day just to show you how you would work it out. You've got this little equation stated in the contract to show you how to work out your price adjustment factor. And as you can see here, based on the changes in these indices, you can see, you know, steel has gone up quite a lot in that time frame. You're able to work out how much extra the contractor gets paid on a given month. And here it's an extra 9.5%. And it's a relatively straightforward way of doing it. It's much more straightforward than all of the other contracts I've seen, to be honest. The JCT is hopelessly complicated. The public works in Ireland 
hopelessly complicated, and most other forms follow that trend. NEC, much more straightforward. And then on to our penultimate slide of this evening. Appreciate we're two minutes over, but if you stick with me for the next couple of minutes, um, I'll let you all go. So this is a new clause. This is option X29, and it was only released, I think, within the last maybe two or three months. Again, it's fairly fresh off the presses. What it aims to do, um, in my opinion, is quite laudable. Um, whether or not it will achieve that in the short term is a different story, but I think that the thought and the ethos behind it is, is very, very good. So what you do by optioning in X29 is define within your contract a set of climate change requirements. And this is something that will be drafted by the and the client whenever they're going out to tender. So for example, using X amount of recycled material, using electric vehicles on the site, using renewable power on the site. Um, again, these sorts of things you would define as the climate change requirements. And ultimately all you have to do here to comply with this clause is to come up with a plan to meet those requirements. Here is my plan for using X amount of recycled material. Here is my plan for using site one material to minimize carbon. Here's my plan for using electric vehicles. There's all of the chargers, that, that sort of thing. The point is it contractualizes that plan. And if you fail to meet the specific um, climate change requirements, that will be a defect. And then all of the contractual defect provisions will kick into play, whereby you've, you're given a certain amount of time to fix it. And if you don't, you could be contracharged. So there is an incentivization mechanism there. There's also the ability to use a, a KPI table for this to positively incentivize the contractor. So, you know, if you're able to have X amount of electric vehicles, we will pay you more money. But by the same token, if you don't, we can take money off of you. It just works in a standard way. You know, I'm not getting into too much more detail on this. The, in my opinion, it's slightly unnecessary. You probably could have just drafted all of this into the scope and dealt with it in that normal way. But at the end of the day, X29, climate change, it draws everybody's eyes to it, I suppose, and, and starts to put the emphasis behind protecting this world that we all live in, which we all really do need to start doing. And um, question is X29 operational now? Yes, it is. You can now download it from the NEC website um, and you can go and download the guidance notes for that as well. So final slide of this evening and I think it's a very good place to leave here actually because it's one of the most important concepts to wrap your head around and that is the use of Z clauses. So as one of our colleagues said just over the blower there, the Z clauses are the contract amendments and you need to be very, very careful when it comes to these because the Z clauses can go in and change any clause of the contract. You know, you might, you might think you've got a week or eight weeks to notify, but the Z clause can make it one week. You might think that ground conditions lies with the client, but the Z clause might have deleted it. So you do need to always consciously read these clauses or get someone like myself to, to do it for you and to review them on your behalf. Um, you know, don't always necessarily think they're a bad thing. You know, sometimes it's just a project specific requirement. You know, you might be working with a public sector client who is bound by the Freedom of Information Act and the Environmental Information Regulations. You know, you might as well write that in as a Z clause because it makes it clear where the risk lies with respect to that, you know, employer specific problem. But, you know, that said, for every one useful Z clause, there's usually 10 unnecessary ones. And those are the sorts of things you need to watch out for. So we'll, we'll maybe leave it at that. So that is us for this evening, folks. I appreciate we didn't quite get through all of our slides. We've about 10 more to go, but what I'll do is I'll pick up on those in the next session, which hopefully is a bit of a positive incentivization to get everybody to go and sign up to that. So without further ado, um, I will leave everybody there for this evening. And um, if you are interested in learning more about the NEC, we do run a 12 week NEC course, which starts tomorrow. So if you are interested in that, you know, get in touch sooner rather than later. But thank you all for coming and I'll see you all next week. Bye.